this club birthed a whole culture of art and fashion and and sex and money and and fame you know when usher said love in this club it it was uh it was probably too much love in this club okay <laughs> girl ombre alert and i am back with another video as promised i told y'all i was going to be back with my regular content so we're back what the hell as promised i told you guys i will be back with my regular content so we're back okay i'm sorry if i was flooding y'all a little bit with the vlogs but i like vlogging and i want you guys to like vlogs from me so yeah the vlogs aren't going anywhere, but I'm back to my regular content. In today's video, we are going to be discussing Studio 54. Now, this is something that I've been wanting to talk about since I saw the Andy Warhol documentary on Netflix. I just decided not to do a video on it. It was pretty complex, to say the least, but I didn't think I had enough material to do a video on that, so I didn't do that. But I do want to talk about Studio 54 because this club was crazy. This was probably the craziest club ever. This was probably the craziest club ever invented. So if you guys are interested, if you wanna know what's going on, what happened with Studio 54, why I got shut down, make sure that you stay tuned for this video because I'm finna discuss it right now. Make sure that you like, comment down below, and subscribe. We are almost to 500 subscribers. I believe we're in the 80s right now. All we gotta get is maybe like 20 more subscribers and we'll be at 500 so please help me do that by subscribing to my channel and showing love in the comments so without further ado let's get into the video okay studio 54 was first opened in 1977 on 254 west 54th street in manhattan new york you already know New York is the it place to be, but this is where the club originated. So it started off as an opera house in 1927. Then in 1942, CBS bought it out and made it a television studio called Studio 52, naming it after their 52nd studio opening. So it was called Studio 52 at the time. Then two entrepreneurs named Ian Schrager, I think that's how you say his name, and Stephen Rubel came together, joined forces, and bought the place to turn it into a club. And they renamed it Studio 54 after it being on 54th Street in New York. So, boom. Then we have Studio 54. It's born. This was the It Club. Originally, I thought Studio 54 was first opened in the early 70s to to the late 80s but this club opened up in 1977 and it closed in 1981 or 1982 this was probably the shortest club opening ever but so much happened in such little time and don't worry i'm gonna get into all of it okay just to name a few just so you guys know how like pop in this club was some of the celebrities that attended this club included michael jackson diana ross elizabeth taylor um the rolling stones who else um mick jagger i think he was a part of rolling stones i don't know that was before my time andy warhol just to name a few liza minnelli just to name a few people that attended the club i'm gonna get into the rules and regulations um in a few okay even diana ross said that when the club closed down it affected her social life she said and i quote i haven't been going out to any place since studio 54 closed up and that's the truth and then she expressed in an article, which I will leave linked below if you guys are interested in reading it. She also expressed that after the club closed, she just started dancing and playing loud music at home because that was like the closest thing to comfort that she could really do. 
since the club had closed down. This club was so exclusive that if you weren't famous, you couldn't get in. And they kept a lot of things under wraps, including illegal activity, because they had such a strict like guest list. So, of course, if regular people came to this club, they would spill the whole tea, tell everything that happened inside. So they knew that they couldn't do that. So this was like a strict celebrities only attendee type of party back during the late 70s. So imagine, because back then, it, that was before social media. It was just probably magazines, newspapers, and this was probably the, the birth of MTV and all of that. So just imagine like if newspapers caught wind or got pictures of anything that happened inside the club it would have been over like a lot of people's careers would have been over i mean sylvester stallone was in there like actors were in there too so it was people from all walks of life especially gays and minorities so this was like the it club like this club birthed a whole culture of art and fashion and and sex and money and and fame around the grand opening so they prepped for the grand opening by making a guest list months in advance so the guest list was already made they did tons of pr so people already knew that it was opening regular people i should say the the closest they could get to getting to the club was being outside seeing celebrities walk through so that was like the closest you could get to the club if you wasn't a celebrity so the requirements to get in you had to have a bank account of six figures like you had or you had to be famous or you had to like have basically dress the part like wear designer no fashion you had to look like money if you wanted to get in if you didn't look like money if no one knew who you was and you wasn't getting in leading us to the interior of the club we're going to talk about some of the most like infamous parts of the club so if you're ready let's get into it we're going to start with the sex room okay the sex room is self-explanatory is the room where people was getting their freak on no alcohol is flowing you know this is the late 70s before the crack epidemic of course so this is like where people have money you know opulence they're drinking crystal they're drinking alcohol they are snorting coke so people you know when people get inebriated they want to have sex so they created a sex room for that so this was the room where people was said to have a lot of orgies with multiple people having sex at a time yada yada this was a room where your fantasies could come to life you could do do who you want to do you know without being judged that's what steve rubel said one of the partners of studio 54 he created this room specifically for that as a gay man himself he just wanted a place for people to have sex without being judged so he created the sex room and back during that time in new york city people were having sex everywhere like on the train in a grocery store in the alleys where whether it was two men two women whatever the case may be like the 70s was the wildest one of the wildest eras if not the most wildest era of all time because of that because everything was so um sexually expressive and everyone was so free and didn't really care about what other people thought and it was a very rebellious decade if you ask me because of those reasons um because of you know the the type of experimental drugs that people were doing i mean you know we're not even just talking cocaine we're talking about heroin we're talking about speed we're talking about quaaludes we're talking about all that type of stuff prescription drugs as well people were on multiple drugs at that time um including you know having sex with multiple people so um the sex room was one of those places where you could do everything you want to do in that one room and we have the rubber room um the rubber room is kind of similar to the sex room only difference is it was made of complete rubber so there was rubber sofas the balcony was decked out in rubber as well so if you wanted to do it on the balcony you could 
this room was created so that it could be hosed down and cleaned easily because people would have so much sex. Yes, I said that right. It was created so that it could be hosed down and cleaned of bodily fluids and it would be easier to clean bodily fluids and drugs, you know, by just hosing it down and cleaning it that way. So do with that what you will, you know, use your imagination, but that's, I mean, when I first read that, I was like, wow, that's really disgusting. Um, yeah. Something that I thought was interesting too was scammers would stand outside of the club when you go to New York, you see people like on the street selling stuff, but scammers would stand outside. They created these maps that said that they knew like a secret tunnel that would lead to Studio 54 and they would give it to people so that they could get in the club when there's no way that would happen. These tunnels did not exist. There was no tunnel and you know, and we all know that there's secret tunnels in New York um, underground that will lead you to certain places. We know that, especially with New York being so big, um, knowing the infrastructure in New York. But these maps were fake. The tunnels, there was no tunnel that led to Studio 54. So these people were staying outside New York, you know, and charged people like hundreds of dollars to get this map that led them nowhere literally nowhere a way that they found out that this was proof was that a man actually was found dead in one of the dangerous tunnels in new york and he was dressed in black tie so he had like suit you know suit and tie outfit and he had one of the maps in his hand so he must have slipped and fell uh went down there like looking for the entrance following the map and it didn't lead him to anywhere and he slipped and fell into a dangerous tunnel and he died. We all know New York and New Yorkers are crazy, but the things that people would do to try to get in this club was crazy. Like the the hysteria, the momentum, the the eagerness to get in this club was through the roof. I mean, people would put themselves in dangerous situations just so they could get a glimpse of what it looked like on the inside. Even in Halston, there's a, a series on Netflix called Halston. I saw um, Halston, which was a fashion designer back during that time. He frequently visited the um, Studio 54. There was a scene in the show where a woman was trying to get in the club. She would come every time and um, they wouldn't let her in each time. And then she tried to get inside through a vent and she got trapped. That actually did happen, but it wasn't a female, it was a male. And they did find a dead body in a vent leading to Studio 54 and the person suffocated to death. So, I mean, you're talking two dead bodies, drugs everywhere, sex, money, alcohol, anything can go down in this club, anything. You know, when Usher said love in this club, it, it was uh, it was probably too much love in this club, okay? Over time, things started to trickle down, especially at... I mean, once you get dead bodies, like, around the club or in the club, then you know that so, this, this is crazy. And you know that the police is going to be, like, checking on this club even more. So, soon enough, the club lost their liquor license. But that didn't stop the club. They lost their liquor license, so they couldn't sell any liquor anymore. But they did amp up on other drugs. There was other things that people did back then, other than just drink alcohol. So they actually hired people that were required to create lines of cocaine for people to sniff. For people in the club because they couldn't do alcohol anymore so they were doing cocaine instead or whatever else they were on back then instead of alcohol that was one thing that they started to do that was you know technically illegal i mean having drugs in the club is illegal anyway moving forward things were getting um pretty heated in the club but the club was very very successful Within even just the first year, they made over $7 million in profit. I'm talking profit, like pocket, po they pocketed that money. 
And they were able to do that because they were doing something illegal and they were not paying taxes. So they owed $3 million worth of taxes that they did not pay. So of course, the FBI ended up raiding the club. This becomes an IRS issue now. So the FBI raided the club in 1981 and the two owners were arrested for tax evasion, of course. The police not only arrested them, but they confiscated over 30 kilos of cocaine in trash bags, not to mention other drugs as well. They both were sentenced to four years in prison each, but Steve Rubell, he died of AIDS in 1989, so he probably didn't end up serving any time. Um, or maybe he did serve some time and then he passed away. Steve Rubell once said, the key to a good party is filling a room with guests more interesting than you. Maybe he was right because he did become a successful entrepreneur regardless of the things that he did that was illegal. So now to this day, the building of Studio 54 is owned by a theater company. So that is the story of Studio 54. If I find out any more information, you guys will be the first to know. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Please leave your comments below because everything I said was kind of really crazy. Thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for sticking with me. And let's keep the content coming. I have such a busy schedule, but I plan on keeping the content coming. So stay tuned for the next video. I love you guys. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.